for anyone who's joining these for the first time, these are our uh, weekly global industry calls and they're an opportunity for PR professionals from all around the world to come together and um, essentially exchange ideas and, and, and best practice on how the industry is adapted to the current crisis. Um, so today's session is slightly different in that we're not going to be uh, talking about the pandemic per se, uh, but we're going to be discussing uh, racism and particularly racial and ethnic inequality in public relations. So um, we're really pleased to be able to uh, be joined by a special guest and, a, and an expert in this area who I'll introduce in just a moment. <laughs> um, so it's uh, just a, a, a quick point from us really, it's been a, a really uh, fast paced couple of months really for, for the PR industry on this issue. I think there's a very much, there's a heightened awareness around the fact that PR suffers from a, a deep seated cultural problem when it comes to race and ethnicity. So um, it's, it, it's uh, refreshing that there is a renewed impetus and a real kind of uh, tangible appetite to deliver change on, on this issue. So um, as I said, we're really, really pleased to be joined um, by our special guest today. So uh, Barbara, so we're very pleased to be joined by Barbara Phillips. So Barbara is uh, an experienced transformation and employee communications leader uh, with extensive experience with FTSE 100 global brands, including EY, GSK, and Diageo. Uh, so today she'll be reflecting on her own personal experiences and discussing uh, re the Race and Ethnicity Equity Board's plans to combat inequality facing black and ethnic minority practitioner practitioners. And uh, just for reference, uh, race and Ethnicity Equity Board can be a little bit of a mouthful. So the nickname that we use is REAP. So if you do hear that uh, um, abbreviation, do, do bear that in mind. So um, I will kick off really um, with a quick question for Barbara before we kind of get into the, uh, to the meat of the discussion. It would be really interesting just for everyone on the call, Barbara, if you could just give uh, a very brief overview of, of your own uh, professional career to date and to really explain how, we, how you've come to arrive at this situation. Great, thank you so much for inviting me, Cry, and welcome everybody. So um, I started uh, in PR back in the dark ages <laughs> when um, well, you still had to, I'm not even going to say fax, you still had to, well you kind of used to have to fax journalists and um, we weren't, it was just before the internet. Um, and I loved the storytelling, I loved the people, you know, piece, I loved getting brands out there and telling their stories, so that's what attracted me. Um, and I gradually worked my way through and I ended up more in-house, in so I did in-house PR for a while, but then I was completely attracted to kind of integrated communication, so internal, external, and then now it's, it's evolved into transformation and change, because that's been on the agenda for a very, very long time, so it's um, culture change and I'm uh, particularly interested in, in employees experience. Now if you're interested in employee experience as a black person myself then clearly that's going to bring you to the question of race and why my experience might be different to my white counterparts experience um, and it's through that you know following on from George Floyd's murder and I call it an outing of racism in corporate UK because it, it really wasn't an area that anyone discussed unless you discussed it amongst your friends and family. So I'm delighted, first of all, that it's outing. It, there's an outing and it's out there because it's cathartic for plenty of us. Um, and then secondly, um, when I see lots of, I saw lots of people, you know, they were texting and tweeting and posting on LinkedIn about diversity and how they stand with Black Lives Matter and what they're going to do being the cynical, because I am fairly cynical because of my experience, I said, well, you know, I saw something from PRCA and a lot of us on the board did. I thought, well, that's great. Talk is cheap. What are you actually doing? So to their credit, you know, I'm here today and the board is here today because I said, actually, we're going to, we need, we know we need to go further than just the five protected characteristics. Clearly race is a much bigger problem on its own. It's an issue on its own that needs its own singular attention. And through that and through the, the other members of the REAP board, that's how the board was founded. So um, that's really kind of how I got here. Everyone was looking, the attention was drawn on the issue of race. People in the industry were saying, well, what is everybody doing? What's professional bodies doing? And PRCA stepped up. Thanks for that uh, intro. And you mentioned the word culture there in that. And I think the, the turbulence of this year has, mm -hmm. 
and you and I were speaking just, just now before that, has kind of given businesses and brands the opportunity to reset culture. Um, and as part of that, racial justice and, and racial and ethnic equality are kind of a, a, a fundamental aspect of that. Is that something you'd agree with? Absolutely. I think post COVID-19, even though we're not past the pandemic itself, I think everyone recognizes that there's been an evolution and that, you know, as an organizations, their cultures can actually progress. And it is different because people are at home. They are working virtually. They are working flexibly. You know, people are really finally talking about well-being and, you know, psychological and, and, and mental well-being, which often wasn't, but wasn't discussed and was seen as a weakness. And now, you know, self-care is seen as something that's integral into what you, you know, offer your employees. So I think, yes, I think culturally, there's an opportunity post kind of COVID-19 and the pandemic for us to have a, 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 a kinder, more open, more humane cultures, especially yeah. within PR, which can be really harsh. So I'd like to get into, before, before we touch on a few of the key points, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear about your own experience. So you've mentioned you've been in the industry for a number of years. Mm. I've seen a, a lot of changes take place throughout that time. Mm -hmm. But what has it been like being a black woman in public relations in the UK so far? So um, when I discuss this with my friends and colleagues and, you know, I'm, I'm, or anybody who knows me knows that I'm brutally honest because that's just the best way to be. I, I had a conversation, oh, I don't know, three or four years ago, where I said to my kind of peers and colleagues, I've given up with my ambitions. I've just literally crushed them and I'm slinging them out the window because it's pointless because I'm not ever going to get anywhere further than I am now. You know, I've done well and I'm grateful for that, forever grateful, but I'm just not going to get anywhere. And it's, you know, and, it, and I decided personally at that point that I'm going to start, you know, speaking up to every organization that I've been in. I'm going to, speak up about conditions and it's it's interesting because up until the, to this year you couldn't actually say the word race so i talk about bullying i talk about harassment i talk about being treated differently i talking about talk about being overlooked i, be, I talk about being not you know giving opportunities why i wasn't in succession planning i just danced all the way around but didn't actually say this, I think this is racially motivated why I'm sort of stuck in this same position, which is a good position. I think I'm not, you know, not disputing that, but why don't I go any further? So I think it's interesting that most black and Asian and, you know, diverse ethnic um, practitioners just ha almost have a silent code where, you, you know, if something happens and you get on, it's a massive celebration. But if it doesn't, you, you, you're like, well, okay, that's kind of what our lot is. Not that we accept it, but that, you know, we have to find different ways and we're very inventive, finding different ways to push against and try and get anywhere. But I'll admit, I said, corporate UK, you win. <laughs> I'm not trying to get any further because clearly you don't want me to. So let me just start talking about how I feel now. Now I've given up on, you know, being promoted. Let me just talk about how I feel because it will, it will obviously stop my career trajectory, but I don't mind. I'm just going to start talking about it. And, and what was the response? Because you've obviously you've worked at some big organisations that I mentioned at the beginning. What what was the response from them when you started airing your own uh, experiences and beliefs? It's always rejection. It's the same. It's almost like a playbook. Um, I was obviously the issue. I was the problem. I was if there was any disharmony or the culture wasn't suitable or inclusive, it was because of me. Um, everybody else is happy. Why can't you be happy? Yeah. You know, how how you're really lucky to have mm -hmm. that role. Really lucky, Barbara. Look around you. You know, you're the only black person. I didn't say that, but I would be the only black person. Really lucky. Look around you, you know, just put your head down and go with it. You know, you're really lucky. That was generally the attitude. And um, how, how has it changed? Or has there been any change that you've, you've noticed kind of over the I think the last couple of times, because I do make uh, it an issue of mine. Well, not an issue. I make it a practice that everywhere I work, you know, if I see bad, not necessarily racial, I mean, I'm talking about bullying, harassment, misogyny, sexism, there's plenty, plenty to choose from. I always, call, I always call it out. I always go to the most senior person who will listen to me and call it out. And then they'll, they'll fling it under diversity. Oh, yeah, covered by diversity. Well, how I think it's changed is, is fundamentally, as I say, it's cathartic from, there's, you know, thousands and thousands of black and Asian and ethnic minority um, practitioners 
who can actually exhale and say, oh, it's out there. It's finally out there. And that's a massive shift. Because I say, in all my years, I haven't actually been able to say the word race. If I say the word race, I am just shut down. You are shut down and managed out of the business. You, cannot, you couldn't even say the word race. Mm. So that's a massive shift. I mean, that's, that's, that's the beginning. It's not the end. You know, it's the beginning of movement. Because you can, you know, for any, for you to, if, you're, if I was coaching someone, you know, you have to acknowledge that there's an issue for you to start to deal with it. If you're not going to acknowledge there's an issue, then nothing will ever get done, which is what has happened in our industry. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's depressing when we think about it, but it's, it's, it's an, also it's, it's positive that this has happened. And, and as uncomfortable as it is for a lot of organizations, it's, it's overdue and, and very much needed. Um, yeah. In your own career, you, am I right in saying that you've, you've worked mainly on, on, con, on a contract term basis? I made that decision for a number of years ago because I could only really, I have to say, survive or endure by six months. I mean, the, the last permanent role I had, it, it, it was that just under a couple of years, and I was spent, I was burnt out from how difficult it is to try and operate at a mid-level with everything that goes on, the microaggressions, the comments, the, you know, you are blamed for everything. It's, it's exhausting. So I said, well, let me just do short, sharp stints, six months, maybe a year. Then I take a break. If anyone looks at my, my uh, profile, I actually have to take a break in between each interim assignment just to replenish and refresh myself. So when I go in, I start really, you know, top notch and ready to go and raring to go. And I don't get jaded and I don't get really, you know, bitter and twisted and too cynical. So yeah, yeah I've chosen so I can have a break in between. And also it's matched, this goes back to kind of post COVID cultures. That's matched with my working environment, my home environment. I have one daughter and that means I've never missed any of her plays, any of her, I mean, I've had the flexibility. I've done my bit as I was a school librarian. I was a school representative for her parents, you know, association. I've managed to do loads of different things and also volunteer, I'm a magistrate. So that, it was two things. It was one, the environment I found too intense forever, you know, permanently, but also it's helped me have a, a more enjoyable life because, it, you know, I have the flexibility. Yeah, the, the flexibility that that offers is great. I think a lot of individuals are now in, in that position, um, mm -hmm. given the year that everyone's been through. I think the point you made about um, contracting on a short-term basis, if you were a, a white woman from a, a, a middle-class background, do you think you would have signed up to uh, one of those organizations on a long-term basis you think you would have been full-time employment so what, what are your views on that well it's interesting because quite a few of my contract my the two or three last permanent roles i had i started as a contractor i went in as an interim and not, they offered me a permanent role so clearly you know the opportunities are there um and, I, and so i think the answer would have probably some of them some of them i would have there's a couple i would have remained you know, there's, there's an old saying that you never leave the role or you never leave the organization. It's you, you leave your line manager. It's your line manager that drives you out. And that has been my experience. And there's been a couple of times I really wish I could have just escaped from <laughs> under this person and worked somewhere else in the organization. And it would have been, you know, I would have been happy to stay. But the way, and this is why we talk about what we talk about in our goals, there are systems in place which are quite toxic where you can't actually, you know, if your line manager doesn't give you permission to work somewhere else in the organization, you can't. And that's yeah. so wrong, like, obviously so wrong, because it's open to abuse, and most of the time it is abused. One of the issues that, um, or one of the topics that kind of was front of mind of the terms of reference in mm. the read document was this notion of equity. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of conversation about diversity and inclusion, but you were really, uh, really strong on the point that we needed to establish racial equity could you just mm. explain a little bit about that for our audience yep i mean there's lots written about it but i think from our point of view where we are on the board it's you we we as you know practitioners we want just want to be equal we want equal amounts of opportunities uh, you know the equal treatment it's mainly mainly around opportunities because you know if you t if you talk to some black prs you know in a group will say, if you're not any good, you won't succeed. We're not expecting to succeed because I'm black, but I'm not expected, to, I don't expect to be held back because I'm black. And that's where the equity comes in. It's kind of equal opportunities across the board. 
So rather than say we've had equalities, we've had before diversity, there was equality. So it used to be equalities and then it became diversities and then diversity and equality. And clearly that hasn't, we are where we are. So my point about equity is just let's level off the playing field. Seriously, I know it's an old one, but let's make it level. And then there's some work to do. We're not going to start today. If I'm back here, we want the equity means I come back to ground zero, if you like, and then start looking at how good I am and then start looking at my qualifications and my attitude and my ability. And if you know, I'm good enough, promote me. That's equity. And um, I'm just going to come on to Reeve in, in a moment, but mm. just to touch on something that you mentioned earlier about your own personal experience. Mm. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the industry of late about microaggressions and mm. aspects of discrimination that people weren't really aware of. Mm. Um, how has it been in your own career? What examples of, can you provide of, of uh, instances where you faced inequality directly and how, how, how has that impacted you? Well, it's very insidious. I mean, if you've been around long enough, this will be, I have, I have a sister who's 10 years older than me. So in her day, if you like, you know, a generation above, the discrimination was obvious. You just wouldn't get the job because you're black or you just, it would be obvious that, sorry, we don't employ your type. But it's now in corporate UK, it's very, very insidious. So there's this whole nature of Going through, okay, good example is, I won't name the organisation to say I don't have a lawyer, but it was, it was an interim role. It was senior level. Um, I had six interviews for that. It was an interim role. I had six interviews. My colleague had two who was in, you know, in the group together. Someone had one phone call. Then they, they had a chat on the phone. But Barbara, I jumped through six hoops to get exactly the same role as someone else. You know, that's, I think it speaks volumes. Um, and in the end, I only ended up spending, I didn't spend that very much time there because it was awful. You know, it, the, the red flags were there, but I thought, well, you know, it's a great role. It's a great organization. Maybe it'll be fine, but it actually wasn't. So my progressions would be those sorts of things. When I get there, um, I work somewhere else where I was talking to, she was executive director of HR. And she said to me, we were just, just introducing ourselves. I said, oh, I'm divorced. You know, um, I live with my daughter. And she actually said to me, oh, does she see her father? I said, uh, yes, she does. We're divorced. You know, we weren't shacking up. <laughs> it wasn't here. Yeah. I don't know what she thought. She said, oh, does she see her father? Really just out there. And I took a deep breath and said, yeah, yeah, she does. Thank you. Every other week. Thank you. So it's... It, you know, there are plenty more. There's a touching there. There's the ones that are common, touching the hair. It, but the, I think what the most, the most destructive one is if I, and I've done it and I do it and I raise my head above the parapet and I say, you know, we we're having discussion. I think she stoops out of line there. Sorry? Sorry, ignore that. I think we just had okay. some spirits on another, another okay. line. No, I think, um, I, you know, you're in a situation where you, you, Put your hand up and say you know that's quite to toxic i mean there was an organization where i was managing someone and she i got when i started the role she was literally hanging on by a thread she was burnt out so i helped her i coached her you know you know she had to take some time off which was great but when i went to speak to like kind of the executive director about the culture in that particular team she just flipped it on me she said, it was fine before you got here you know what are you doing? Look at the way that you speak. Everyone's complaining that you're too aggressive. Everyone's complaining that you're just out there and you know to really watch your tone. And she just completely flipped it on me, which is what normally happens. Which is pretty shocking. Um, <laughs> it is shocking. <laughs> so moving on, I mean, we're, we're I, I think we're in agreement that we're moving into a new era with regards we to how- we could, how we could be, we could be. Some of us are, PRCA definitely is. Let's not just give everybody the blanket of comfort, like, yay, PRCA's done it. So we're all doing it. No, not, yeah, not I'm a realist. So, but so PRCA, I'm definitely. Very much aware that we're, I think we're at the very start of this journey. Mm. Um, and it's, and it's going to be a long, a long journey to get to where we need to get to, anywhere near where we need to get to. But it, um, we've discussed REEB in brief, but could you just share with the audience what, uh, Reeb is and its vision for the industry. Where would you like to see uh, the race and ethnicity equity board in five years time? What would success look like? 
I think, um, first of all, again, I have to applaud PRCA for when we were having kind of the informal conversation. So there's, there's 13 of us on the board where we're all, you know, poor Karai and we're all going, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? You're talking about it, what you're doing. They said, oh, we, you know, we need to do something specific. We have to give, um, you know, uh, a round of applause to PRCA for the organization who agreed to have a board dedicated to racial equity. Because we have to remember, as I described earlier, you couldn't even say the word race until before George Floyd was murdered. You couldn't actually say the word race in a pub, you know, in, in, a, uh, uh, in a conversation in corporate UK. So hats off for that. Um, and secondly, for forming the board and for giving it standing committee status, which means we are not just a talking group. We are not just a agitation group. We are integral in the constitution of PRCA, which means I've been appointed to the PRCA board, um, uh, which they obviously we've agreed to diversify. And it means that long after I'm in my grave and I'm dust, Reeb will still be there. There'll still be a board agitating and trying to move forward the conversation on racial, um, racial um, and ethnic, ethnicity, um, you know, our, our, our mission and our goals. So on that point, what we really want as, uh, an, as a board and as an organization, we've got a set of goals. Uh, I'm just gonna read through a set of goals. It's really all of the things that everyone kind of expects and is talking about and talks about, you know, um, desperate, desperately, but not, never really puts it all together. And I think what the, what's great about our board is we've put everything together in one place. So if you read our goal, if you get a chance to read our terms of reference and look for our goals, it's really clear what we are. So there's complete clarity. So some of them, things like, you know, board representation, that's a no brainer. Um, definitely among senior decision makers, it's where the discrimination and where the poor practices are amongst decision makers. And say, I mean, in my experience, I've been trapped under a line manager and I had to leave the organization because she wouldn't physically let me move mm. anywhere else. So that's, but I think things like that people think about that haven't really put to paper, which I'm really proud our board has, is things like psychologically safe environment for black and ethnic employees to succeed unimpeded. I mean, that's massive because generally, as I say, from my experience, and I know mine isn't alone, it generally isn't. So what we want for the board is to be, have a set of goals that we want in the industry, people, leaders in the industry to adopt. We're going to help you do that. We're going to produce guides to help you do that. But also we had a set of goals and outcomes from PRCA, um, including, you know, meaningful representative um, members from different you know, ethnically diverse communities, which we're doing. Um, a couple of things we're working on is trying to implement race as part of the ethical standards. Yeah. Because if you, if you think about it, you know, as a practitioner, as an organization, how can you really stand up and call yourself an ethical organization if you practice racism? You can't, you I mean, you've been allowed to up till now, but you know, that should change. So there's lots of, big chunky pieces, but then there's lots of more subtle pieces in terms, and they all revolve around internal cultures. All the success or failure of this is organizations, internal teams, as well as agencies, looking at their culture and transforming their culture to make it more racially equitable. That's, the, that, that's what I spoke about getting us to ground zero. Then there'll be the maintenance. But right now our job is to get us up to that position. We're not there yet, we're way back here. So yeah. that's, I think that's our role. And so in five years, I'd like us to be here and have started maintaining and then pushing the boundaries even further. And I'd like organizations to be coming to us, you know, for, to ask on how can I do this better? How can I push the envelope more on this? How can I do more in this area rather than what do I need to do, which is where we are now. And you referenced um, the fact that there, are, there has been work already in the industry, but it hasn't got us very far. Um, which has led to the point of us establishing this this body. Mm. But what is your what is your own view on how the group collaborates with other industry initiatives? Because obviously there's been quite a few that have popped up, particularly over the past few months since the mm. tragic murder of George Floyd. So, mm. what what's your own view about how Reeb collaborates? Um, I think there's no need to reinvent the wheel. 
I think in the bigger scheme of things, most practitioners or decent people are just saying the same thing. It needs to change. It needs to be better. Let's look at race. Those are kind of the three areas. So collaboration is if someone, you know, in another organization, even another professional body is doing a really solid piece of work that's pushing, you know, the boundaries, opening doors, cracking it open, we should collaborate with them. We should, I don't, I see there's no benefit in competing because this is too important to compete which means everybody on the board, and I, don't, I feel that's true, has take your ego and just sling it over there a minute because it's really not about us. It's about the whole industry. So if someone's doing a really good piece of work that can benefit our outcomes of you know, pushing racial equity and changing cultures so it's psychologically safe for everybody to work in, and we should, we should absolutely, I think we should collaborate. And that's, that's in kind of our way, one of our ways, ways of working terms that we collaborate with anyone who is saying the same thing, as long as they're implementing it in an ethical way, in a professional way, you know, in a non-damaging way, then absolutely we should partner with them. Yeah, I think it's a vital point, especially the point about, you know, you can compete on commercial priorities, but this, this, there's really no room for, uh, for competition on, on an issue as important yeah. as this. Yeah. Um, well, we've flown by already. We, we've done almost half an hour of speaking. So. I can talk. <laughs> but we've got uh, around 20 people in the room. So is, is anyone else um, who on the chat, would anyone else like to ask Barbara uh, a question, whether that's about um, the, the rework or about her own experience? Um, if, if anyone would like to, you can feel free to turn your camera on now. Yep, please do. We're terrified, everyone. <laughs> hey, Barbara. Hi there. Um, first of all, thanks very much indeed. And I was delighted to read all about Reeve and specifically the changes to the uh, Board of Management, um, which have concerned me for a little while. Mm. Um, Corey kind of stole my question um, in asking about integration with other PR industry efforts, mm. um, but mm. one that's um, grabbed a lot of attention and um, it seems like um, reasonable momentum is uh, the blueprint. Mm. Um, and yeah, I was just wondering, having been through sort of PRCA audits and CMS mm -hmm. audits and things mm. like that before, I'm just keen to understand if you're going to start to try and plug those things together. So something like the blueprint where you're audited and then you're audited every two years and have to mm -hmm. things like that, will what you're planning on doing try and integrate or if not integrate recognize that or are you planning on setting up other sort of additional things as well i know my fd who spent a lot of time answering these things is going to ask me at some point so <laughs> get, out there. get out there right now i'd say thank you for that question that's a great question i'd say from from the inset or from the outset of the organization from the board you know, all of us on the board, we all have our networks. We all know people. We're all linked in some way. It's kind of six degrees of separation. So, yes, I, I'd already seen the blueprint. I'd already started I follow Elizabeth on Twitter. And I think right now our journey is to find a way for it. Just as I said, not to compete, not to, you know, repurpose something, not to recreate another wheel. So we're working on trying to find a way that absolutely pushes forward because the outcome that she's looking for the blueprint looking for we are looking for so i'd say to you any and the blueprint and any there's lots of things lots of groups out there have started before george floyd and they started and i said we'd like to find a way a mutually beneficial way to tie up i mean if we have lots of little if you think about the kind of the helix model there's lots of dots and there's lots of you know we want to be connected to everybody because we're all pushing for the same outcome and there's absolutely no need to do anything different so i say yeah we're in the process of seeing what we can do i mean the people who are involved in these you know these other endeavors they might decide that they don't want to work with the prca and that's fine even in that case i will still find a way not to just replicate you know at the very least we should then say okay we're we're recommended recommended you go and do this next because yeah. it, it really people have to understand it really isn't about us it really isn't about ego it's about this big outcome that's so long overdue you know it, it's not it's not worth me saying well i don't want to work with that person it's like yes let's find the best positive way yeah. to get there 
So sort of recognising rather than replicating some of those efforts. Absolutely, because if they're working well, sometimes we can add to, you know, there's, you, there's never enough good ideas, so you can add to, you know, expand slightly, you know, amend slightly just for our purposes. We're open to all of that, all of it. Superb, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. And um, just, to, just to add on to that, the, the point about collaboration, I think um, Reeve were quite strong on that point in the terms of reference. Um, it's something that is really written into their existence, the fact that they're, they are, uh, as a body, uh, wanting to uh, amplify the efforts of those who align with their, with their goals. I think on the, the point that uh, Barbara referenced earlier, there are certain structures within the framework of the PRCA, which already exists, whether that's the code of conduct or uh, the communications management standard. And a lot of Reeves work will be about actually reviewing those and updating those. So the update to the code of conduct has already started. The CMS review is about to get underway. So it's that there's the external pieces of work which are going on, which we can collaborate with. There's also, we've got to get our own house in order on this issue as well. Barbara's playing a frontline role. Uh, in helping us achieve that. Um, Siobhan, I've noticed that you've turned your camera on. Um, I'm hoping that's because you'd like to ask a question. Yes, it is. Thank you, Corey. Um, I said to Corey, thank you, Barbara, as well. This is brilliant. And to all the uh, members of the board, congratulations and welcome. Um, and we're here to cheer you on and support and champion what you're doing. It's long overdue. So thank you. Indeed. Um, my question relates to, I've worked in an organisation where Diversity and inclusion was a big part of the culture change and the transformation of the organization. And communications and internal communications was playing a key role in that. And I, I, I was therefore heavily involved. Mm. But one of the things that the organization was very keen to do was just to focus on one particular aspect of diversity and inclusion mm. um, and therefore focused on uh the lgbtq community mm -hmm. as a as a as sort of a springboard to bring the conversation about diversity and inclusion into the workspace mm. and create comfort and inclusivity for people mm -hmm. but didn't want to diversify the topic beyond mm. that mm. What are your thoughts around that? Because I think I see other organizations doing similar things where they mm. choose to uh, put the microscope on one particular part of diversity and inclusion. Um, and I sort of see it as, well, we're resistant. We don't want to talk about race because as mm. you're saying, well, that's a bit uncomfortable. Mm. You know, we're not comfortable talking about, you know, skin color and how we've, you know, oppressed people in the workplace is much easier to talk about another aspect of diversity. Mm. Have you seen that elsewhere? And do you have any thoughts about how to perhaps, you know, help people overcome and say, it's not just about one aspect of diversity and we focus on that, we should focus on all aspects? Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm going to physically put my cynics hat on because I have a right. very cynical idea about this. A lot of it is diversion tactics. Because, I mean, if you think about it, there are things, and if you're familiar with the term intersectionality, yes. so fine. So if you, it can be a way, if they were really, if you're, gen, if you think, if you're genuine, you will say, we're going to talk about the, you know, the LGBTQI um, community, but obviously there's race, there's generations, there's abilities. It's all, it's all sectioned in, isn't it? There's an intersection, yeah. Yeah. but you know, so if you're, if you're being genuine, you might say this year, or for this quarter, but not forever. But you can't diminish the intersectionality piece. That's number one. Mm. And then second, I, well, I think it's, I'm cynical about it, is because of um, things like unconscious bias. I have absolutely no time for unconscious bias. It, I think it's an utter waste of money because it just presumes that you're going to do it. I mean, I've done them. I have, to, I have to do them. Virtually every big firm I work, I have to go and do unconscious bias. And you sit there and you type it in and then I go back to my desk. Whatever I felt before, <laughs> I still feel after my desk, which is a waste of time. So I'd say this whole tactic of focusing on one, it's so you can't say, oh, look, you're not giving diversity, you know, in enough attention. You're not so, they say, oh, yes, we are. You know, we think that that community is the most un, you know, repressed and 
And, it, and I think it's a ploy. It's a diversionary ploy because if you, the real conversation, which is what is the tragic way that we've come about, because obviously a man mm. has been murdered in public, but the point is now we can talk about race. Everything you've seen is any avoidance tactic not to talk about race. And we all know race is the one, it's the hot potato, which is why nobody wants to talk about it. So in terms of how you can help, you can, when you, if you're faced with that, first you should be pushing for a really, really big, chunky, juicy budget. If you're, if they're really serious, which is again, I've still got my cynics hat on, then there should be some weighty budget behind your and endeavors. Now, if you have a weighty budget behind your endeavor for one protective characteristic, it's really easy to slide all the intersectionality in because you have the budget. Love so it. give me the money. Fine. If you want to do this community, fine. Give me some money. When they give you the money, you slide in all the rest because it's all intersectionality because no, no one is just one thing. No one has just one characteristic. And that way, you know, this is pre what COVID and what we are, where we are now, you can turn it around. That's Fantastic. I love that, Barbara. That's brilliant. I really like the way you, you sort of strategically, right, if we've got budget for one, then weave in all the others and, yeah. and bolster the budget for, exactly. for the action. And then things be will making. be happening until they feel like saying, okay, because they're never going to say to you, it's one community. So yeah, yes, absolutely. The other one, the other, other characteristics, that's really important. Because I've had somebody look at me when I did some diversity work and say, no, this is all about generations. What about the people who are older? And I'm just like, hello, can you not see, you know, things happening to me? No, no, but it's people who, what really matters is, you know, generations. And they're not going to, so you just go, okay, then. And then I had to do exactly that. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Thanks very much, Siobhan. That's an interesting point that you just mentioned at the end, Barbara, that kind of what aboutery when people mm. this thing, you know, issues of, you know, all the way from disability to geographical inequalities, which, you know, are, are issues in their own by in their own right, but we're talking about something that needs to be uh, addressed in isolation. Uh, mm. So, so yeah, really, really interesting to hear your views on that. I'm conscious that we are running out of time. So, um, if there's no one else who'd like to add any other further comments, if it would be a very quick one, I'm going to have to wrap up quite shortly. Um, that Barbara, just, just a quick you. one, Corey, just a quick one. Sure, Liam, go ahead. Hi, Barbara. Really Hi see you on board. Um, I'm new chair of the public affairs board. Lovely. And if you take the public affairs industry as part of the P, uh, part of the PR industry, the public affairs industry is even less diverse than the public <laughs> affairs industry, uh, than the, mm. the PR industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so we've got a, a lot to do there. So I'm looking forward to getting involved mm. much more in this. And, and part of that, and some of which is unfortunate because of the COVID situation, part of this is how we actually actively encourage mm. career opportunities in this. Because um, I, I work with my partner who works in a East London sixth form college where the... Uh, the cohorts are, are generally black and Muslim mm. and never even thought about careers in this kind of industry mm. before because they, they, they're conditioned to go and this is not work for you. Mm. And we've got a lot of work in that space there. The, the school's initiative that PRCA mm. started off was, a, was a, an interesting starting point for this, but we've got a lot yeah. of work to do to kind of make, and, and particularly on the public affairs side, mm. there's, there's too much hiring of everybody else who's exactly like everybody else in the industry. And I say that as a northern belligerent <laughs> guy who kind of sits in rooms full of Tories most of the time. <laughs> can, I add, can I add to your point that, in, that it's, this is what we've done with our terms and reference. So everybody, if you get a chance, please go to the PRCA website and look at our terms and reference and our goals. Because it's not only the, re the recruitment, you know, even if I had to do six interviews where everyone did two, it's the re retention. If, that, if there's not that psychological, so I think you'll find that young people's reticence and hands up guilty, I did a Q&A two weeks ago where I absolutely torched, said, don't go into this, not, don't go into this environment unless you, you know, we sort this out because I'm not going to encourage people to go in until we sort it out. But why you're getting the, oh, I'm not even bothering because it's the horror stories that have trickled out about why you're there. Getting there is fine. But if you know, as a quick recap, you can get recruited, fantastic, but you may not have the same pay. You've got all the microaggressions. It may not be psychologically safe. Why would you? So I think you'll find that's, that's not the type of, it's not the type of work 
it's really the environment and that's why I, I say it's culture I, I agree entirely and, and it was fascinating hearing your experience because um, and, and I've, I've witnessed this in various organisations that I've worked with over the years. There's there's a there's a there's a way of dealing with women who are seen to be aggressive. Whereas mm. if I'm aggressive in a meeting, it's seen as a positive. <laughs> assertive. Whereas, You're a, you know, men are yeah. never aggressive. Yeah. They're only ever assertive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm northern, so we are. I'm, I'm, I'm northern, <laughs> so we're outspoken anyway. Um, <laughs> and I've been I've been picked up on it in, in, in various places I've worked, but mm. it's never been seen as something has been difficult it's been something mm. that you need to go oh well, that's good and it's motivational for people yeah. yeah why don't you channel that what you'd like yeah. is why don't you channel that into success but no no yeah. it's, if you're black it's just or brown it just yeah i, I had a, had a perfect example this morning um we, we had one of my clients sent a very late at night aggressive and patronizing email to a junior member of my team who's asian and, and female and she contacted me this morning. I saw it in the camera. That's I'm not happy about that. And I said, it's okay, leave it with me. I'll deal with him. And I emailed him. And then we had a phone, we had a Zoom call, literally just before we came onto this. And, and he just backed down instantly because <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm older than him. I'm definitely more aggressive than him. And if you're going to speak to my team like that, I'm not having it. But it's, it's just the, the, the inherent culture of, I'm a client, I'm going to bully you because you're a woman and you're younger. Mm. But also what you've displayed is, is allyship and not performative. And this is what we need. This is what we need. This is why it's a partnership. It's Reeb can't do this on our own. You know, we need partners within the industry to you know, ally with us and support us and you know, agree that a lot of people agree it needs to happen. You know, yeah. we're not in isolation. And if you do have true, true allyship is really powerful. Because you'll say, no, I'm not going to let Reed be sidelines. They're going to come into my organization and they are going to change things. And that's what needs to be done. You know, and that's, that's really important to us. It's, but, it's, um, and it's, it's difficult for a lot of organizations, particularly when you're dealing with clients. And, and I, I have a benefit of being you know, the owner of the business. So I get to choose who I work with. And if I don't like clients and they're the way they deal with, the way they deal with us, then I'm going to say, I don't want to work with you. But I'm going to call them out on that because I don't, the whole this is a this is a terribly this this is a profession where everyone's conditioned to be nice to clients do what clients mm. want and perform mm. well and so forth so mm. the ability to stand up for yourself in an organization mm. where you don't think the management are going to stand behind you exactly it's completely diminished isn't it yeah, it's non-existent yeah. Although I know we have to wrap up but it's just uh, Kerry quickly and sorry Barbara I couldn't join you um okay, earlier yeah. today just a, a very quick reflection. I mean, obviously, the public sector are a bit further ahead on this, only because there's more laws, rules, and regs, and mm. they've been working well, on only years. slightly, Carrie. Only, only slightly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is a hell of a lot of work to do, and mm. you know, even when I was working at the NHS, just to pick up on what Liam's just said, mm. um, you know, obviously, you know, the nurses on the front line, the doctors. I mean, you know, that was more diverse the other way. Mm. But, you know, mm. we very rarely got you know any people of you know, colour, different nationalities, etc., cultures, backgrounds, applying for those jobs. And we did go around all the colleges and the schools and some of what we unearthed, and I don't know if there's something bigger here to, to, to think about in the huge challenge we've all got anyway, mm -hmm. um, but we'll achieve that challenge, I'm sure, um, is that some of the cultures, that, you know, at home, and how you prove this, I don't know, it's only sentiment, were actively kind of pressured into going into other industries, which were mm. perhaps perceived to be more respected, mm. more monetary reward. Mm. So even I, though think, I think that's any family. Any family yeah. wants their children to go and get the best possible job and yeah, get the best so, salary. Yeah, so there are some things you're up against, and I'm sort of quite a big fan of social mobility. So, Corey, you yeah. can get that schools programme back up and running. <laughs> and that's something we can all try and support. But yeah. I mean, I absolutely agree. I think it's, you know, that's an intersectionality. So social yeah. mobility and socioeconomic status is an intersectionality, mm. if you like. But still, you know, with my cynical hat on and having worked, I did some work in the, in the NHS. There still is, it's still the internal culture. It's still, oh, that, you know, yeah. they'll, they'll have an auntie or a cousin or somebody who's worked in the NHS and told them how absolutely awful it is. Oh, it's, it's wonderful on one side because it's rewarding and you're dealing with people and you love that aspect. But the other side is, you know, nurses being told by white patients, they won't, you know, touch them. You can't touch me. 
do, I want yeah. a white doctor, not a black doctor. You know, yeah, some of the Eastern Europeans. Yeah, some of the Eastern Europeans have faced that um, as well. Exactly. Yeah. So and yeah, that is a culture issue. That that's we, a cult. That's to say, everything we talk yeah. about, everything that we will, you know, push yeah. forward is about internal cultures, and it's the structures and it's the policies that are allowed to fester. And I do say fester because it's we yeah. are where we are, and that is. So if people are rejecting, you know, our industry or rejecting a, 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 a sector. You know, don't look outside to what's happening to them. You need to look what's happening within your organisation. That's yeah, where you well, are. I think that's a key point. The, one, one of the, the, the biggest things that's kind of coming out throughout all of this is the fact that diversity is the easy part. Um, mm. Even though we do have a real issue with uh, the, the supply line of talent in the industry and there's the schools outreach programme, which is trying to address that. Uh, the kind of the bigger picture is, is really confronting the cultural problem that we have yeah. uh, so that we can create truly inclusive environments where those people can not only come through the door but they can actually thrive and develop successful yeah. careers which is where the equity comes in exactly because... yeah so it's yeah it, it's a, a huge issue and, and um yeah we're very grateful to yourself barbara and to all the read volunteers board board. guiding our efforts on, on, mm. on this issue um i'm afraid we've run out of time so um thank you to Barbara, obviously, for, for a really fascinating overview of, of your own career to date and then plans for REAP and, and to all our audience as well. So we've had some really great questions. So yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. If you'd like to learn more about mm. the organisation and Barbara's reference, the terms of reference, please do follow uh, the Race and Ethnicity Equity Board on Twitter. Yay. You can find out more about the organisation on our website. The address, um, I put it onto the chat, but it's prca.org.uk forward slash REAP. Uh, mm -hmm. So do feel free to... Um, get involved and learn as much as about the initiative as, as possible yeah, um, I, um, yeah Barbara thank you very much um, pleasure thank you and um, I will be in touch with everyone uh, with updates on our speaker for next week's session